beginning of 1945. After having suffered heavy defeats during the previous year, and after having lost a lot of territory, the German armies find themselves completely torn to pieces and already practically encircled on the original border of the Third Reich, along with part of Polish territory. Although it may seem that the end of the war is near, and that the exhausted forces of the Wehrmacht will limit themselves to defending their territory in a desperate way, the Germans will be able to recover and organize final offensives of the that no one believed them capable anymore. Many may be wondering today how this was possible, and whether launching this series of attacks was the best strategy to adopt. And is that, how were the Germans able to recover from such defeats? What measures did you take to continue having combat units on all your front lines? And finally, what did you intend with this series of final attacks and what impact did they have? Well, that is exactly what we are going to see next. First of all, and to give us an idea of the offensive power that the Wehrmacht continued to have in recent months, let us briefly list each of these final operations. On December 16, 1944, the Germans launched the massive Ardennes Offensive. On December 31st of that same year, the Germans began Operation Nordwind, also on the Western Front, with which they surprised the Allies again. At the same time, on January 1, 1945, the Germans began Operation Conrad in Hungary, in an attempt to free the capital of their ally from the encirclement that the Soviets had just established in it. After the new collapse of the Eastern Front in mid-January 1945, the Germans were still able to reorganize and by February 15, they launched Operation Solstice, which we also recently discussed on the channel. With it if you remember, they tried to section Zhukov's vanguards that were heading to Berlin. Later, already in March, they were able to reunite their last units with offensive capacity and began the attack on Lake Balaton, with which they intended to annihilate the third Ukrainian front, to later go on to recover Budapest. And finally, and although much more modest and limited, the German army was still able to attack at Botzen on April 21, 1945 and achieve a tactical victory. So, Having seen the offensives of some importance that the Germans managed to organize when they were already practically defeated, we now analyze how this was possible. As we said at the beginning of the program, the great turning point was marked by the defeats that the Germans suffered during the summer of 1944. In order to recover from them, they had to modify their new divisions and that is how the Volksgrenadier divisions arose. With them it was possible to have quite a few combat units, which even having fewer troops, retained good firepower. On the other hand, at the end of January the Luthen project began, with which, due to the seriousness of the situation, all the military academies and training and recruitment centers were emptied. Thus, tens of thousands of instructors and new recruits with little training were sent to the front line of combat. This Luthen project ended up dismantling the German military training system, and from February and March 1945, the new soldiers who were sent into combat could no longer count on even a minimum of regular training, and their equipment was negligible. This training was carried out on the same front, and consisted only of a minimal teaching on how the weapon that they were going to use in the imminent combat worked. Another measure that was carried out was the creation of the Volksdrums at the end of 1944, which came to have several million soldiers who, although they had little combat value, were used mainly to defend German cities. This allowed the Germans to be able to remove a certain number of German soldiers from these sectors, and to be able to concentrate them in the place where the new offensive was being prepared. Last but not least, we have the return to service of a whole series of wounded soldiers who until recently had been considered unfit for combat. However, despite their condition, they were used during these last months of the conflict in tasks of all kinds. A good example of this was the 32nd Division of the Waffen-SS, which was created on January 30th, and which adopted the same name from its date. Well, having already analyzed the measures with which the Germans managed to have enough troops until the end of the conflict, let us now see the intention they had with these latest attacks, and the reason why they did not focus solely on defensive actions. First of all, we have to highlight that military maxim that says that the best defense is always a good attack. This way of acting was applied by all the great powers that participated in the conflict, 
in which we can even include that first incursion that the French made against Germany in September 1939. It was precisely when they remained purely on the defensive when in May of 1940, they paid for their mistake. And it is that after all, when we analyze the different military campaigns of World War II, we realize that it is a continuous struggle to seize the operational initiative. But how important is this? The answer is yes. With the enormous firepower that the armies of this time were capable of developing on the battlefield, it was more than demonstrated that they could open a gap at any point on the enemy line. Counting also with greater resources in men and material, and with the total supremacy of the sky, these front breaks were more than guaranteed on the Eastern Front from that summer of 1944. On the Western Front, the Americans and British were not so effective and forceful like the Soviets, but their advance, although slow, was equally unstoppable. Although in defensive battles you can gradually obtain some victory and wear down your enemies, in the long run, the only thing that could be hoped for is that the front ends up collapsing in some sector. With each of these allied, mainly Soviet, penetrations, the result in the German ranks was utter chaos. One of the main characteristics of the German divisions of this date was their low mobility, since they were mostly static units. This means that with each Allied break, a large number of troops had a very high risk of being isolated, surrounded, and annihilated. This process was repeated in an alarming and forceful way both in Operation Vagration and in the Vistula Odor Offensive. So, and seeing that this is not a viable option, the alternative that was left to them was to attack. By means of an offensive, it was possible to obtain some important victory, which, taking the Allies by surprise, would cause a significant number of casualties. With this action, it was intended that the Allies would have to divert troops from one place to another to deal with these German attacks, and thereby force them to paralyze or suspend the offensives that were being carried out against the Wehrmacht, or that were about to, to throw. Another of the objectives pursued with this type of action, and this was stated by the German leader over and over again, was to obtain a significant victory that would allow him to be in a better position at the time of a hypothetical future negotiation. Being clear that there are more benefits in a good attack than in a good defense, we must also indicate that the offensive capacity of the Wehrmacht in this final stage was overestimated by the German leader and by his high command, who still lived off the old hits. Thus, the hope that his army would revive those great past feats, also motivated many of these attacks that were carried out with optimism and ambition, which far exceeded the actual combat capacity of said units. General Ross strongly criticized this way of acting and on February 13, 1945, just a few days before the start of Operation Solstice, he told Himmler the following. Instead of organizing an aggressive strategic defense in suitable sectors previously selected and prepared, the only strategy that we are ordered to do is not to cede a single meter of land despite lacking strategic value. With respect to the concentrations of troops that we manage to make as reserves, these are always launched in insignificant local attacks, which are wasted time and time again. At the same time that we foolishly lose combat experienced units, we have to send to the main front other divisions that have been created on the spur of the moment and lack combat value. As is natural, these troops are incapable of facing the vanguards of the Red Army, which, after annihilating our weak divisions, continue advancing. Without a doubt, and in the face of such an apocalypse that Germany was facing in 1945, it was difficult to establish which was the best way to act, and which could be more effective. But, what do you think? What do you think would have been the best strategy to adopt? If you want to analyze how these last operations were developed, such as Nordwind or Solstice, or if you want to see what these last Volksgrenadiers divisions consisted of, I leave these programs in the description. Well, here is this program which I hope you have been of interest. Thank you all for being part of this community, and especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and we'll see each other here as always, next Thursday and Sunday. See you soon.